In the Kremlin, Khrushchev knew that he was losing control of events in Cuba. He was also told that Kennedy was under severe pressure from the military to act. If another U.S. plane were shot down, it might trigger a clash neither wanted. We were informed that Robert Kennedy said that the president himself did not know how to get out of the situation. The military was exercising great pressure on him, forcing him to resort to military action toward Cuba. He feared that despite his will, the irretrievable could occur. We could see we had to reorient our position swiftly. Sunday, October 28th, the 13th day of the crisis. In a dramatic gesture, Khrushchev accepted Kennedy's offer. The world pulls back from the nuclear brink. Radio Moscow broadcast the news first. This is Radio Moscow. Premier Khrushchev has sent a message to President Kennedy today. The Soviet government has ordered the dismantling of weapons in Cuba, as well as their creating and return to the Soviet Union. After nearly two weeks of almost unbearable tension and fear, Kennedy's and Khrushchev's ability to compromise brought the crisis to an end. And now I'm rushing over to meet the president because we are going to mass. And as he stepped into the White House car, he said, Dave, this morning we have an extra reason to pray, and we sure as hell did. The announcement about the withdrawal what came early in the morning and I was uh, in the elevator with, our, with my colleague from Tas Vasilyev. He's now in the United States. And we talked to some lady. And she says, oh, you have listened to the news, she asked us. I said, yes, uh, we are Russians. Oh, she said, has, uh, reason has prevailed as speaking Russian. This was her fir our first reaction from the American side. I think it, it was true. Of course, when this news arrived, because they arrived here on the 28th, that's a fact, they produced great indignation because we felt we became some sort of bargaining chip. It was a decision without consultation. Castro, who had put his nation at the greatest risk, did not play any role in the negotiations. He was not even kept informed. For him, the deal was principally an exchange of missiles in Cuba for missiles in Turkey, serving the interests of the Soviet Union more than Cuba. And we heard over the radio on the 28th that there had been an agreement. They retreat to Moscow. Russian ships steam out from Cuban ports with their decks loaded with missiles. The Soviets are withdrawing under pressure from the New World. Soon the missiles were on their way back to Moscow. And within six months, as promised, the U.S. Jupiter missiles were removed from Turkey. The severity of the crisis prompted the superpowers to take other steps toward lessening tensions. A telex hotline was installed between Washington and Moscow. And in 1963, the United States, the Soviet Union, and Great Britain signed a landmark treaty banning nuclear explosions in the atmosphere, the first such agreement in the nuclear age. But the arms buildup continued on both sides, with the Soviet Union determined to achieve nuclear parity with the United States. The nuclear arms race sapped the economic strength of both powers and contributed to the Soviet Union's demise. Cuba, however, is still communist. To many, the country is an anachronism, left over from the Cold War and due for a massive change as soon as Castro is gone. The Cuban Missile Crisis was the closest the superpowers have ever come to nuclear war. Over the ensuing months and years, the key players have analyzed its causes and its course. I think looking back on Cuba, what is of concern is the fact that both governments were so far out of contact, really. I don't think that we expected that he would put the missiles in Cuba because it would have seemed such an imprudent action for him to take, as it was later proved. Now, he obviously uh, must, have thought, must have thought he could do it in secret and that the United States would accept it. 
so that uh, he uh, did not uh, judge our intentions accurately. Well, now, if you look at the history of this century, where World War I really came through a series of uh, misjudgments of the intentions of others, certainly World War II, when you look at all those misjudgments which brought on war, and then you see the Soviet Union and the United States so far separated in their beliefs, and you put the nuclear equation into that, uh, that uh, struggle, uh, that's what makes this, as I said before, such a dangerous time and that we must proceed with the firmness and also with the best information we can get and also uh, with, uh, with care. That same month, at his villa on the Black Sea, Khrushchev revealed his feelings about the Cuban Missile Crisis to the editor of Saturday Review magazine, Norman Cousins. Uh, Khrushchev was very somber as he spoke about it. He said that I get nightmares when I think how close we came. And suddenly he said I had this terrible responsibility. Was I going to try to, out of pride, just to determine, just to demonstrate to the world that the Soviet Union could stand up to the United States? Was that decision going to result in the destruction of my country and your country? He said it was insanity. Well, there are lots of lessons in the Cuban Missile Crisis, but if I had to pick out... Uh, Many of the participants in the Cuban Missile Crisis have reflected on the lessons they learned in 1962. It is clear that nuclear weapons do not lend themselves to brinksmanship. The avoidance of uh, a situation in which the game takes control is of enormous importance in any situation which has a risk of direct conflict. Give your opponent an out. Look at the crisis from his point of view. I don't mean to say be weak, that's not my point at all. But my point is, look at the crisis from his point of view. Look at the options that you are considering from his point of view. Try to pick an option that achieves your purpose at minimal cost to him, political, military, otherwise to him, that avoids pushing him into an emotional uh, frame of mind which he is likely to lash out irrationally with great cost to him and you. If the United States lacks security, it will be dangerous both for us and for the United States. The same thing is true if you put things vice versa. I think the primary lesson that we learn from the Cuban Missile Crisis, and I hope it's learned on both sides, is that we must try our best to prevent such crises from arriving on the scene because they're just too utterly dangerous. You see, uh, we and the Russians should not play games of chicken with each other to see how far one might go in a particular adventure without crossing that lethal line into nuclear war. In Havana, Cuba, there is a curious memorial to the crisis, the empty shell of a ballistic missile. Last January, a number of participants and students of the crisis gathered here, including Robert McNamara, Soviet Ambassador Alexander Alexeyev, and the son of Nikita Khrushchev. During the conference, it became clear just how imperfect their understanding of the situation had been, and how big a part chance had played. As the former enemies posed for a photograph, the irony was inescapable. The world has changed dramatically since 1962, but it was not changed with weapons. Just how well do we know the next president? Wednesday at 9, we invite you to join us for a special Election 92 report that chronicles the public careers and private lives of George Bush and Bill Clinton. Join us for Frontline, Wednesday at 9.